in the last lecture, we looked at the unfolding of the revolutions of 1848 in Europe. We had looked at the causes that led to a general upsurge of people in various European countries, uh, its similarities and dissimilarities, and uh, whether it would be right to talk of a revolution of 1848 in Europe or revolutions of 1848 in Europe. And we looked in details at what happened in the Habsburg Empire in, in Austria itself, then in uh, the parts within the Habsburg Empire like Hungary, Bohemia, Moravia, etc. And then we looked at the uh, possibility of nationalism and liberalism and even republicanism uh, achieving a degree of success in Italy. We had seen that the movements in both these places had failed as the conservatives came back to power and were able to control the movements by the middle of 1849. Germany was a major storm center uh, in 1848. And today we first look at Germany, then look at the causes of failure of 1848 movement, and finally look at their significance in European history. To quote A.J.P. Taylor, 1848 was a decisive year in Germany and therefore in European history. It recapitulated Germany's past. It anticipated Germany's future. There was a cultural regeneration in Germany which was inspired by the philosophers like Kant, Fichte, Hegel. In literature, there was Goethe, journalists like Joseph von Joris or historians like Dahlmann. They all created an intellectual cultural ambience in which German liberal and national ideas were forged gradually from the second decades of the 19th century. But in 1815, if Germany had a desire for greater unity, it had been frustrated. Germany was made into a federation or confederation under the presidency of Austria. And we had seen earlier in the context of Austria how the so-called system of Metternich uh, tried to uh, even use Germany as a hermetically sealed area where the liberal ideas would be shut out totally. There was a good deal of repression, but even then, the Burschenschaften or the fraternal societies, the World Book Festival, uh, the student movements in their universities, all created uh, an urge for unity, created the, uh, gradually the idea of a German nation, and uh, for a, a, a craving for liberal institutions, constitutions, elected assemblies, and uh, basic civic and religious rights, as also freedom of expression and freedom of the press. So these movements gradually grew between 1815 and 48. The fall of Louis Philippe was followed by the organization of a massive demonstration in Mannheim. It continued to spill over into various other areas and gradually various states of Germany had been affected. Germany, we know, had been a federation of 38 states, large and small. Prussia was the largest. There was a, a very great movement in Baden, a popular movement, which demanded constitution, civic rights, uh, and, and freedom of the expression. Most of the states, except the larger states of Bavaria, Hanover, Saxony, and Prussia, accepted the demands of the popular movements for civic and, and, and uh, other legal rights uh, for a constitution which had been granted. Later, the liberals were able to secure concessions even in these states. In Bavaria, for example, the King Ludwig was forced to abdicate after a scandal involving uh, Danzius Lola Montes had been had come to light. 
Frederick William of Prussia, he summoned the Landtag, the Prussian Landtag, but when it refused to uh, grant uh, money that he demanded uh, and to grant him loans, he prorogued the session. Frederick adopted a stern attitude uh, in the beginning, but the fall of Metternich in Austria made a tremendous impression on him and uh, he had to agree to convene the Landtag to uh, introduce a constitution, to promise reforms and also assuring them that he would try to reorganize the German Confederation and uh, strive for greater uh, unity. The initial success encouraged the nationalists and the liberals to work for German unity. German nationalism, uh, as it were, was awakened to a new life. There had been uh, movements for constitution, constitutions were granted in various states, some liberal reforms were conceded, but that did not constitute the sum of what the revolutionaries or people involved in the movements might have wanted. It is important to remember that apart from the uh, liberal and the national ideas, there was a strand of radicalism as well in Germany. Uh, it might be helpful to remember that Marx and Engels, for example, were active in Rhineland, which was part of Prussia. Marx uh, highlighted in his uh, newspaper, uh, Rheinisch Zeitung, the strike by the Silesian weavers. But when this was stopped, he and Engels uh, were collaborating, say from mid-1840s, they had set up their communist league, were beginning to preach socialist ideas involving the working classes. And we know in 1848, they brought out the communist manifesto, which purported to be uh, the agenda or the manifesto of the communist league they had set up. So far as nationalism was concerned, uh, there was a demand and now a general, a central parliament was called uh, on the basis of popular election to Frankfurt. Earlier the central diet had members who were nominated by the rulers. Now the members of the Frankfurt assembly were elected by the people from the various states it had a total of 586 members and most of the members were uh, liberal intellectuals. In this assembly, several ideas of what the future of Germany was likely to be or what German, future German nation would be had been thrown up. For one thing, there were the ideas of a Grossdeutsch and Kleindeutsch, Greater Germany or Little Germany. The Greater Germany would have included all the German speaking ideas and that was uh, the demand of some people, whereas others felt that it was not within the realm of practical politics because Austria was bound to oppose any idea of German unity uh, by the Germans themselves. Therefore, they opted for Klein Deutsch or Little German solution which would exclude Austria from this federation. The draft constitution was proposed by the historian Dahlmann, but it failed to secure unanimity. After long hair-splitting discussions in which they spent uh, time and energy on uh, such issues as whether to call the Central Assembly Bundestat or Staatenbund, you know, a, a play on words rather than on uh, substance, they decided to have a united Germany, but would, would it be Republican? No. Ultimately, they were bereft of ideas and they offered the throne of unified Germany to the King of Prussia. The King of Prussia refused to accept it on two counts. A, he represented a tradition of centralized autocratic monarchy and therefore to accept the crown from an elected assembly would have been a, a very bad thing and he couldn't have because this would limit his power and he was not likely to do this. 
Second, it would have involved him in a conflict with Austria and Prussia was not yet prepared for this. Therefore, when the king of Prussia refused to accept the crown, the Frankfurt Parliament's work seemed to have come to total nullity. They did not have an alternative uh, contingency plan if the king were to refuse this. And it seemed that attempts at uniting Germany in 1848 had failed and had failed irrevocably. By this time, the conservatives had recuperated their power. There had been massive demonstrations in Berlin and other places in October, violent clashes. <clears throat> but by early, by, by early 1849, the conservatives had recovered from the early shock and were regrouping themselves. Therefore, the movements gradually kind of dissolved themselves. The Prussian king now decided to take the initiative and unify Germany in other ways if he could do that. And he failed to do that uh, as well because again Austria was the stumbling block. Austria had by 1849 also recovered from the shock and we know through uh, Russian uh, help it had brought the entire uh, Habsburg empire under control and Austria was in no mood to allow Prussia to unify Germany by excluding Austria. And therefore, uh, when there was possibility of a war, finally Prussia climbed down, signed what is often been called the humiliating convention of Olmutz and decided to continue the German confederation as before. The hope of the German liberals for a really liberal constitution had been disappointed. Though the king of Prussia granted a constitution, it was not really what the liberals wanted. One answer that some historians have put forward is very simplistic, that the revolutionaries were not really good revolutionaries. They were not effective, they did not provide effective leadership. They were full of big ideas, but did not have enough practical sense. The failure, however, should not be attributed specifically uh, to this kind of uh, a personal failure. It has to be seen in the context of the specific socio-economic circumstances in different areas of Europe and different countries of Europe. To, for one thing, the middle class leadership was half-hearted uh, because of the presence of a defined uh, socialist and working class movement. Uh, they, they, they were afraid, the middle class leadership was afraid that if uh, the movements were allowed to be radicalized by the people, then the revolutions could be taken to other not entirely desirable directions. Now, therefore, they were not averse to a compromise. This explanation was first put forward by Marx and Engels contemporaneously. In fact, Engels very famously wrote that the lower middle class particularly had been torn between uh, the expectation of climbing up the social ladder and the fear or anxiety of being pushed down it all too soon. He and Marx were trying to explain the support of these people for say Louis Napoleon in, in France which ended the revolution in, in France. The Republic was again hijacked by Napoleon later in, and, and transformed into an empire. They were trying to understand this. And as even, you know, this point has been accepted, elaborated and rejected by later historians. But as a recent historian, Jonathan Sparber has put it, uh, I'm quoting him, 1848 was the revolution that fell between two stools, the bourgeois of 1789 and the proletarian of 1917, unquote. As I said, this is a point which has not been accepted by everyone. They had argued uh, 
that it's difficult to talk in terms of a very well-defined working class now. The working class had a very weak presence in Central and Eastern Europe, which had not really witnessed industrialization. Now, the kind of people who were involved in this uh, uh, working class movement were masters, journeymen, craftsmen, artisans. You know, they said they were somewhat like the saint of 1789 rather than a really defined working class that one would uh, identify with the results of the uh, Industrial Revolution. In 1849, nationalism was an Im important issue, but then nationalism was unifying, but also a divisive force. We had seen this earlier in the context of Hungary, that while the Mogyars were very, very emotional and passionate about their nationalism, they denied such rights to other smaller nationalities within Hungary. Now, this division among the various nationalities was something that the conservative ruling class uh, was able to exploit and come back to power. The conservatives, it has been suggested, had also learned their lessons from 1789 and were determined to, to strike back. They very skillfully exploited the weaknesses amongst the revolutionaries and were able to come back. Uh, but even with this failure, it is possible to suggest that the radicals, the leftists if we might call them, uh, they did organize and use new slogans to attempt a revolution in 1848. They failed, but the attempt was significant uh, as it showed the way for the future. The revolutions of 1848 has been called the springtime of the people and like spring, it proved to be transient. The year 1848 has been seen as the climactic point in the process of rapid socio-economic development uh, and political change that Europe had witnessed uh, since the French Revolution of 1789. Liberalism, nationalism, as well as social issues played a very significant role in most of these uh, revolutions. But the failure of liberal and national aspirations uh, were noticeable in Germany, Italy and, and, and elsewhere. It is important to remember that the revolution had really been affected in two stages. The first stage was characterized by the desire for national unity and for liberal institutions. But when there were fresh clamors of liberal outbursts in June days in France, in Paris, and later in Berlin, Vienna, and other urban centers, there was a strong association of the working classes and the poorer classes in these uh, movements. For example, I, I would cite a few figures. In uh, Berlin, 300 people died, of whom only 15 belonged to the educated classes, and 30 were skilled artisans. In Milan, uh, in the clashes, about 350 people died, only 12 of them were intellectuals and non-workers. And therefore, uh, it is not wrong if we look at these statistics to suggest that working class people, uh, whatever their character, had been involved in this in large number and it is these people who had sacrificed their lives during the more radical phase of the revolution. However, there were certain uh, permanent gains. For example, serfdom had been abolished in many places and this abolition proved to be permanent. Seigneurial dues or what remained of the seigneurial dues had also been abolished and even that abolition was uh, permanent. The sudden end of feudalism uh, marked the beginning of progress in both agricultural and industrial sectors in much of these re regions. 
The progress of industrialization and rapid demographic growth indeed produced the new class that we have been talking about, whose significance was appreciated even in 1848. Tocqueville, for example, Alexis de Tocqueville, the French politician, author, uh, historian, he wrote that the working class was astir and the chief aim was no longer a political revolution but a social revolution. This is very important that one is talking of social revolution. Later, Hobsbawm, uh, uh, a noted English historian, he noticed the presence of working class in almost all the countries uh, where revolution had broken out in 1848. And this class was not interested in just political change. They sought some kind of a social transformation. Apart from the social question, let, if we look at the political, uh, the, particularly the national question, uh, we have seen that nationalism failed to have much uh, headway in Germany or, or Italy. Now, in Italy, what happened has been described by Gramsci as a passive revolution. Again, I am quoting from uh, Gramsci, quote, what was involved was not a social group which led other groups but a state, Piedmont, which even though it had limitations as a power, led the group which should have been leading." Unquote. This is what he calls a passive revolution. That the popular movements failed and in future, Italian national unification was achieved by the state Piedmont under the leadership of Cavour. It is important to quote Namia, I am quoting him. Quote, the year 1848 proved in Germany that union could not be achieved through discussion and in agreement, that it could be achieved only by force, that there were not sufficient revolutionary forces in Germany to impose it from below and that therefore, if it was to be, it had to be imposed by the Prussian army." Unquote. This is exactly what happened later and Namir may well have uh, been inspired by what actually happened to draw his conclusions for 1848. Finally, it has been suggested that uh, 1848 was a turning point in which European history failed to turn. Now, it is possible to elaborate this by suggesting that it was indeed a turning point when Europe failed to turn, if what was on agenda had been a shelved for all time to come. If on the other hand it is argued that what was sought and attempted in 1848 were gradually achieved later, then 1848 could be seen as a premature attempt rather than as a total failure. And, and indeed, uh, in, in uh, 1848, uh, the new regimes which had been created uh, in, in certain areas had vanished by 1851. But as we have noticed earlier as well, many of the changes which had been uh, established had been permanent. For example, the ending of the feudal obligations of, of serfdom and forced labor in the Habsburg Empire for, for one. There were other and more latent kind of successes which were suppressed by eight, eight, in 1849, but only gradually emerging or re-emerging in course of uh, the, the next decades. Uh, socialism uh, had certainly been important, very marginally important in 1848, but in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, socialist, uh, socialism grew and socialist parties emerged in most countries. So, it anticipated the future rather than achieved immediate result in 1848. Kosuth's Republic or the Hungarian autonomy had collapsed uh, with the revolution uh, or collapsing of the revolutions in 1849. But in 1867 came the Ausgleich or the agreement that actually created or transformed the Austrian Empire into the Austro 
Hungarian Empire. The revolutions of 1848 to 51 at a level did change the political life of Europe. It was probably not uh, in the manner that the revolutionaries had uh, intended or either the conservatives or the reactionaries had predicted. But 1848 did constitute a watershed. It had been an year in which Europe, the whole of Europe virtually was astir. We had seen earlier that England, it is usually believed had been out of this, but England had the Chartist movements. Liberalism, nationalism, radicalism, even socialism were all uh, some uh, important ideologies. They had inspired these movements. People were involved. The middle class and intellectuals provided leadership everywhere. Now, all these constituted the strength as well as the weakness of the revolutions of 1848.